Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achena. Welcome back to my OpenGL series. So today we're going to be talking about how we can render multiple objects on the screen. So far, all we've really done is we've rendered that Cherno logo on the screen once and we haven't like, we, we haven't rendered more than one object. So we're going to talk about what it takes to actually render another object or the same object, maybe at a different position or an entirely new object and how in general we can go about rendering multiple things. This is going to set up a bunch of things for the future, as all of my videos seem to do. Don't worry, at the end, in like a hundred years from now, probably, it'll come into it and it'll all tie in nicely and you'll understand how everything works, hopefully. Um, but yeah, so this will be kind of important for things in the future. And also it's just a good thing to kind of talk about initially before we dive into it. So if we take a look at our code, I'm just going to run it real quick so we can see what we have. We basically added I'm GUI last time so that we had this kind of um, debug overlay, by the way, I solved that whole mouse pointer kind of being in the wrong place problem. That was because I was using the Intel GPU inside my computer. I switched, uh, to the Nvidia one and it works fine. So clearly it's something to do with Intel's drivers. I might make a video in the future talking about that, but it's perfect now, as you can see. Um, anyway, so we have this channel logo being rendered and we've got this, uh, model matrix that we're modifying here using IM GUI and everything seems fine. Uh, basically our goal for today is going to be to render another one of these at a different position and we'll see what it takes for us to actually do that. So if we look at the code, um, nothing really too complicated is going on, but if we take a look at the code that actually draws that channel logo, it's this line over here. So we do render.draw and if I just kind of alt uh, F12 into that, so you can see both, you can see that, um, we basically bind our shader. We bind our vertex array, we bind our index buffer, which actually isn't 100% necessary because the vertex array already has a binding to the index buffer. Um, but anyway, and then we actually issue the draw call, which is this line over here, which draws that uh, channel logo onto the screen. Now, here's the thing. Uh, the thing that determines where this channel logo gets uh, drawn, or in fact, let's just discuss these three lines first of all and what they actually mean. So shader bind, is important because it binds a program for our GPU to actually use to render whatever we're trying to render. That's the shader. The shader, a lot of people, again, think of shaders. It's really important that you actually understand what shaders are. Shaders, which are also called programs by OpenGL, are literally that, they're a, they're a shader program. They're something that allows us to say how something will be rendered. We're basically telling the GPU what to actually do. That's really important. It goes way, it's nothing to do with like lighting or shading or anything like that. It's literally just us giving instructions to the GPU as to how and where and why and whatever we want to actually draw what we're trying to draw. So that's really important. That's step one. Um, then we bind the vertex array, which is again, the array that contains all of the actual data. So the program or the shader says what to do with the data. And this vertex array is the data that we're going to do stuff with. So this includes our vertex buffer and our index buffer. That's all that we've got at the moment. Vertex buffer, of course, contains all of the vertex data, including, including the positions of each kind of point that we're trying to render, texture coordinates. I think that's probably all we've got, but if we were drawing something a bit more complex, we might have other, other things in there like vertex colors or normals or binormals or tangents, or there's a lot of things that you can put into uh, vertex data, which we will get into in the future. The index buffer, of course, contains the indices into the vertex, in, in, into the vertex buffer so that we actually know like what to render. The index buffer contains the indices into the vertex buffer so that we can choose what, which vertices we actually want to render and how to kind of assemble all them together. And then finally draw elements just says, Hey, you know, using that index buffer, access the vertex buffer and call the shader program on all of those vertices individually to actually get it to, to draw and eventually rasterize our object onto, onto the screen. So that's kind of a bit of a summary of what it takes to render that one kind of channel logo. So if we want to render another one in, like with the, it'll look exactly the same, but we want it to be somewhere else on the screen, how do we do that and what do we actually need to change? Well, okay, let's think about it. First of all, the shader, does that need to change? Well, the shader, is kind of, if we take a look at what our shader even looks like, it's just this thing over here. Um, the vertex shader just takes in a bunch of data from the vertex buffer, which is this part over here, and for also just directly from our CPU as uniforms. And then, uh, well, sets GL position, which determines where the vertices are gonna be. And then also uh, outputs this texture coordinate to the next stage of the shader pipeline, which for us is the fragment shader, 
which basically takes in that texture coordinate from the vertex buffer, sorry, from the uh, vertex shader, and then also takes in two uniforms from the CPU, and then just basically samples the texture using the texture coordinate and outputs the color that it retrieves from that texture sampling into this output color over here in our final frame buffer. So that is how, that's what our shader does. So if we think about the shader, is it specific to any kind of position? Well, no, because it takes the position in from somewhere, doesn't it? Well, let's look at where it gets the position from. So the first thing you might notice is that, yes, we have a position uh, attribute up here, which means that this is coming in from the vertex buffer. So what we could do as just one of the ways that we could do this is we could supply different vertex positions. Now, what that would require is having an additional vertex buffer because we would need to create a second vertex buffer which contains all of the positions of the second instance of the Cherno logo and then we could use that to actually put them somewhere. And that would work, that's fine. That's one way to do things. Let's see if there's another way. So the other thing that actually happens here, you can see that this position also gets multiplied with this uniform, which is our model view projection matrix. So what we could also do instead of changing that attribute and that vertex buffer is we could just change that model view projection matrix uniform, right? We could basically just provide it with a matrix that had a different transformation applied, like a different model matrix essentially, which positioned our object somewhere else in the scene. And then when that got multiplied with that existing kind of vertex attributes that we have, those existing positions, it would put them somewhere else on the screen. So that's kind of the two ways right now, or other two pieces of data that we could actually modify in order to get the two Cherno logos to show up in different places on the screen. So in this case, what I would do is I would leave the vertex buffer alone. And in fact, right now I think it's set to like 100, 200, or like it's not kind of normalized. I'd probably just set it up to be centered around zero. And then I would just provide two different model view matrix, uh, model view projection matrices to actually position them somewhere else on the screen. Because having two vertex buffers is an unnecessary kind of memory usage that we have in our GPU. And also we need to rebind them, which is not as fast as just providing a different uniform. In fact, it's pretty common to just provide a whole set of, of different uniforms every time you draw. Whereas a vertex buffer, we don't necessarily need, need to change it in this case, so we don't need to actually worry about that. By the way, I, I did just say that rebinding a different vertex buffer is slower than uniforms. That's not actually true. Sending uniforms over to, over to the GPU actually involves transferring data from the CPU to the GPU. So I didn't actually mean it's physically faster to do that. I'm just talking about the fact that we don't need to have two redundant sets of data that we need to bind between and basically it makes it feel like we have two different objects. In this case, it's a lot easier for us just to uh, provide a different model view matrix and that's it, a model view projection matrix and that's it. So let's take a look at how we might do that. So if I go back to um, our application or CVV, what I'm actually going to do first of all, I'll close this render a thing view. Um, is uh, I'm just going to like think about these positions that I've actually supplied here. So these are all texture coordinates. They're fine, we don't, need to, we don't need to worry about them. But what we have here is we have a 100 by 100 pixel or unit. Uh, in this case, one unit is one pixel um, square here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make it so that it's centered around zero, zero. Because right now it kind of goes from 100 to 200 and that's not great. Um, because it means that if we provide any kind of translation to it, it's going to be from this as the origin. So we don't have an origin that's actually zero, and I would like our origin to be zero. So what I'm going to do is, because it needs to be 100 by 100, is I'm going to make uh, the kind of left bound and the bottom bound negative 50, and then the right bound positive 50, because that gives us a 100 by 100 square. So I'll change this. Basically anything that is 100 needs to be changed uh, to be negative 50 and everything that is 200 needs to be changed to be positive 50, okay? So this is going to become negative 50 and this is also going to be negative 50. I'll change all the 100s right now to be negative 50, just like that. And then these are going to become positive 50s and I'll just leave a space here so that everything kind of lines up perfectly. Okay. There we go, done. So if we just hit F5 to look at this, what we should see is because zero, zero is the bottom left of our screen, if I set the position of this to zero, zero, what it should be is kind of centered around our zero point. Now it's a bit hard to see, and additionally, I think we have a camera transformation applied. So if I just hit stop here real quick, and I take a look at the model view projection matrix that we're actually supplying, 
So this is our view matrix. You can see that it's translated negative 100. I'm not gonna worry about that. What I'm gonna do for now for the camera is just leave it to be a translation of zero. So I'll kind of leave all this code here. It is a bit redundant because obviously we, are, we have no translation. So this matrix is just an identity matrix, which means that we might as well not multiply it at all, but we'll, do, we'll change this stuff in the future. That's why I'm leaving the code in. Um, so we have this over here and it just got a lot darker outside and now it's raining. So if the lighting in this video changes, I'm sorry, but that's how Melbourne weather works. Okay. So this view matrix is basically just, a, we, we don't have any transformation applied to our camera. It's, it's just in the kind of middle, it's in the default position, which is just zero, zero, zero. So if we look at this now, now that we don't have that transformation, if I just set this to, uh, uh, zero zero you can see that basically this channel logo is kind of centered the center point is that zero zero and of course it goes negative 50 outside in both uh, X and Y so that's where we're at right now just so that we're on the same page so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, render this thing twice except what I'm going to do is change that model view projection uniform here. So the color, we can leave the same. Color does not matter at this point because we're rendering a texture anyway and we're not tinting it by this color or whatever. So this is just, might as well not exist. Um, in fact, I'm probably gonna stop setting it because it's just confusing in terms of code. So I need to bind the shader. Now you'll note that of course, render a draw does actually bind the shader. That's all fine, but we need to set up uniforms. And in order to set uniforms, we need to have an active shader bound so that we can bind them to the right unit, so that we can bind the uniforms to the right shader. So we need to uh, basically draw. So first of all, we know that shader bind already is activated here, so we don't need to bind again. So what I'm basically gonna do is I'm gonna bind my shader, and then before I draw, I'm just going to set this uniform twice like this, right? So before every draw, I'm setting that model view projection uniform. Now, what I need to do before I set the second one is of course, actually change it. So what I'm going to do is we have this model matrix here, which is kind of our, well, our first translation. What I'm going to do is go up here to translation, copy and paste that. I'm going to call this translation A and translation B. I'm going to put this one maybe at 400x instead of uh, 200x. And then if I go down here, I'm going to use translation A to get the first model matrix here. And that's what we're going to actually send. And in fact, just to, just to keep this a bit cleaner, I'm actually going to enclose this in a scope along with that set uniform mat four, just like that. Okay. And so that's basically us setting the first uniform and maybe I'll even put the drawer into the scope so that it kind of makes sense. This is kind of one operation to draw. And now I'm going to do the exact same thing to what we have over here. It's, it's just that we're gonna use translation B instead. So identical, same thing. It's just that we're using translation B instead. Okay, and we need this shader bind really only for the first time we run through this loop because draw will bind that shader and never unbind it anyway. And since we're not binding additional shaders, this will all work. You want to make this code a bit more robust, it would be wiser to actually move that into here. Um, again, if you call bind shader on a shader that's already bound, that's a bit redundant, that's a bit slow, that's a bit of a waste of performance. Usually in more complicated setups, such as an actual game engine or a graphics engine, you would have a some kind of caching system that would be like, hang on a minute, you're trying to bind the shader that's already bound, that's redundant, I'm just not going to run that OpenGL call. We don't have anything like that set up, obviously, but it'll be fine for this example. Okay, so translation A and B set up differently. And now what I'm gonna do here is as I fix these IM GUI errors, I'm actually going to make sure that we have translation A and I'm also gonna add translation B into this IM GUI window as well. So we'll have A and B just like that. Now let's hit F5 and see what we get. All right, check this out. So we have two Cherno logos. Let me just move this out of the way. And if I modify that first one, you can see it moves uh, the first one over here and I can move it up and down or left to right. And then also uh, the second one over here is modified via that second slider that we have over here. Pretty cool stuff. So that's basically it. That's how you render two objects. Really all we're doing here is we're, re we're, we're rendering the exact same object twice. We're not changing anything except for a single uniform. And the reason we're doing that is because we want it to show up in two different positions on our actual screen. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, cool. That's how I render multiple objects. So 
if I wanted to render some kind of tile map, maybe I'm making like a 2D game and I have like this kind of level that's just a tile map, I guess I'd just write a for loop that goes ahead and does this. No, this isn't the solution to rendering everything because if you do that, if you just have a for loop that renders a thousand tiles on the screen, that's gonna be pretty slow because that's a thousand draw calls and you it's just that there's no, it's not gonna be fast at all. You'll probably notice very poor frame rates. I mean, it still probably will be above 60 on decent hardware because there's not, nothing much to render here. And a thousand draw calls on a PC isn't awful, but you can actually draw that in a single draw call by doing something called batching, which is where you actually shove all of your tiles into one vertex buffer and then have kind of, instead of doing it the way that I did it here, which is I'm just changing the uniform, you can actually do the other method that I mentioned, which is basically instead of having, like we're basically changing the vertex positions that are in the vertex buffer. And if you set that up, but instead of having two different vertex buffers, you shove it all into one vertex buffer, and then you kind of just render everything all in one go, and all the data's already there because the vertex buffer is very large, and it contains all the positions for every single tile you have. That will be a thousand times faster than if you go ahead and you re and you bind a shader, you change the uniform, and you do GL draw elements for a thousand tiles. Okay, and we are going, we are absolutely going to explore doing that kind of batch rendering method because it's like for two D games, it's a must. For two D rendering, it's a must. Even if you're rendering like layouts or like kind of you know text UI stuff like that, for text, it's vital because every kind of character that you render in text is a separate draw call. Or it's a separate like quad and we don't want them to be separate draw calls so this is we'll definitely cover it in the future very soon probably but the reason i did it this way is because this is kind of probably the way that makes sense and it's probably the most simple way and it's also really really useful if we were rendering 3d objects that were quite complex this is 100 percent how we would actually do that and additionally um it opens up the one of the most important things that we need to talk about which is the thing that is different about these two objects is just the uniforms so what we need to eventually get into is something called a material. And a material is really just a shader and a bunch of uniforms. And we'll get into that in the future. So leave a comment below as to if you want me to continue with this kind of 2D stuff and cover the batch renderer in the next episode, because I'll probably end up doing that, I think. But otherwise, we might talk about materials and start getting into some more exciting things like that. Both topics are very important and we'll have to cover them anyway and they're very exciting. So just leave a comment below and thumbs up any comments that mention which one you agree with and we'll see what we can do for the next episode. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit the like button. You can also help support the series by going to patreon.com forward slash the churno. Huge thank you as always to all my lovely supporters. All of the source code for every single video is up for patrons. So definitely support the series if you're interested in getting the source code. And there's also a bunch of other rewards to thank you for your support. I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.